Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolute pleasure being with all of you here today, and um, it's an absolute pleasure as well being with Nick Clegg, who um, had many different lives and careers. He was in government. He was the Deputy Prime Minister of the UK, and he's currently the President of Global Affairs at Meta. Um, Nick, it's good to be with you. It's very good to be here. So, Nick, I'd like to start off with my first question, which is for the government leaders that are here. You uh, are probably the only person that was able to transition smoothly from government to the private sector. Uh, being a deputy prime minister, you are at the helm of government, uh, if I may say so, and then you moved to a leadership position in the private sector. How was that transition? Oh, well, somewhat accidental. Um, uh, it wasn't planned, and uh, I feel exceptionally lucky to be able to have made that um, transition. And for all of you who have made big changes in your own um, professional lives, you will, I think, all uh, confirm something which I experienced, which is that uh, doing something completely new, um, where you are uh, entirely untested, is, of course, a very rejuvenating thing to do, because you have to learn all over again, which I have found a very uh, interesting experience. Um, and, of course, the world of... Um, you know, the sort of ancient politics of the House of Commons and the Yabu debates in the House of Commons is a, a completely different galaxy to the, the glass and steel modernity of Silicon Valley. And yet, notwithstanding those superficial differences, there are some striking similarities in the sense that um, both government at least in my experience in the five years I was Deputy Prime Minister, and now my role uh, at Meta, the, you know, the world's largest social media company, um, you're just dealing with um, an astonishing versatility of different issues, um, many of which you can't predict, many of which you're not entirely in control of. Um, but, but to that extent, I feel there is some similarity. And, and one of the reasons I was interested in making this transition from the world of politics to the world of tech is that I have seen in the time that I was in politics, in the UK at least and in Europe, a very, very significant shift in mood uh, from the political, the media, sort of cultural classes towards social media, that it sort of swung from excessive utopianism an almost idealism when, when, when social media first erupted into the world, you know, what it was a decade and a half or more ago, where social media was considered to be the solution to all of our problems, and now it's sort of almost swung the other way, and in much of the debate you'd think that it's the source of all of our problems. And of course, neither is really true. Excessive optimism and excessive pessimism, neither of which are sensible attitudes towards technology. The, the truth is always somewhere in the middle. And so for me, as a sort of refugee from politics into Silicon Valley, it's been very interesting to try and play a bit of a role, almost as a bridge and as a translator between these very different worlds. Um, because I think that, and I dare I say it, I think um, you and your administration have been real leading examples of a, a wonderful combination of optimism and realism about tech. And I think that is the... That is the right mix. Um, I think tech does offer great, great opportunities to the world, but of course there are all, always downsides which need to be mitigated. Um, and I think if we can get away from that violent mood swing of sort of excessive utopianism and excessive pessimism, then we can, we can really extract the best uh, from technical, technological innovation for, for us all uh, without, you know, whilst avoiding those two extremes. People think of tech as a finished product, but as we see, it's a product that's currently in development, and there are so many iterations, so that's why there are problems that we discover as we go along, and um, our approach in the UAE is always to try to work with the relevant players to ensure that we're able to progress towards the direction that we want to go in. I'd like to move to the name of the company. So it moved from being called Facebook to it being called Meta. And it was really just a testament to your belief that the metaverse is the future, that you're going to bet everything on it. How far out is it? And, and how much of it is currently hype versus being something concrete that we're going to see uh, in the near future? I think the truth is it's kind of both. It's, it, it's here now. We can all go out and buy the Pico headset from ByteDance, uh, 
Quest headsets from, 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 from Meta. Um, and you can experience immersive VR games or fitness apps. Uh, there are wonderful uh, virtual reality developers right here in the UAE developing um, medical applications so medical students can learn how to uh, develop their medical skills in an immersive experience. Um, I was reading about a local uh, content creator here in the UAE that has developed a fantastic new tool for kids at school who want to learn about Van Gogh. Uh, and they can, they can walk the streets of the towns in France where he painted some of the most famous Impressionist paintings. You can feel and touch and almost sort of sense that environment in a way that you can't in a 2D world. So in one sense, it's already here. And yet in another sense, the, the, the holy grail, which is f f f augmented reality, where you have the world around us as it is now, and you can, you can supplement it with digital products and services and experiences in a completely blended way using lightweight, um, spectacle-like technology, uh, that is clearly still some way away. In fact, much of it still depends on technology which hasn't been fully invented yet. So I think the truth is we are on a journey. It is a long journey. It's an expensive one. Um, you are in effect creating not a new app or a new piece of hardware or a new experience. You are in effect creating an entirely new computing platform. And the shift is one from, in effect, looking at things, particularly phones that we all hold in the you know, palm of our hands, to actually being in that thing, to actually being immersed in the experience, which currently we can only look at through the sort of 2D experiences. If you can imagine, you know, we all have spent, particularly during the pandemic, so much time using these wonderful products like Zoom and others to be able to speak to each other in sort of these serried rows of sort of passport style sort of pictures of, of each other. Just imagine sitting around a virtual meeting room as an avatar or eventually as a hologram and having a meeting, not staring at a screen, but being in a virtual room together. Now, if that sounds futuristic, um, it's actually something which can happen now. I, for the last year or so, have been holding my weekly meetings on a Monday with my team around the world in the metaverse, in a product that we produce, Meta produces, called uh, Workrooms. And, you know, we, 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 are, we, we look, everybody looks suspiciously about 20 years younger and several pounds lighter that's the avatars that people tend to tend to choose but the amazing thing is not least because the audio technology is so good once you have the headset on and you're talking to people you feel you're breathing the the the, the same air in the same room because the audio technology is as if someone is sitting to your right sitting to your left sitting a couple of meters across a, a large meeting a, a, a large conference table so i would urge for those who've not experienced it to experience those and then to, in answer to your question, you will get an, a, an insight into not only what is possible now, but what will be possible in the future as we move towards a new computing platform based on a profound sense of presence, a sort of immersive sense of presence, regardless of geographical distance. So I'll still go back to this question. Give me a prediction, five, 10, 15 years. I'm not going to give you a date in the diary. My, my hunch is, I'm not an engineer, my hunch is that once the flywheel of technological development starts, and remember, of course, Meta, we've renamed ourselves Meta, but we're not alone. This is not something that, thankfully, this is not a new computing platform that's going to be built by one company. It's going to be built by a constellation of different companies doing the operating systems, the hardware, the experiences, the software, and so on and so forth. It's, it's like the rebirth of the internet. It's a much more complex undertaking than that. It's not just ourselves. You know, a lot of the big players, you will have seen the plans from, or well, the reported plans from Apple, from Microsoft, from ByteDance, and others. There's a huge ecosystem developing around this. My suspicion is that as things start developing, they will develop a moment, momentum of their own. But I have to stress, I think the full all singing, all dancing, augmented reality future that I depicted earlier. That is many years away. So don't you think that we might have a chat GPT moment? And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Six months ago, if yeah. you sat with many AI experts, they would not have predicted chat GPT. And the level of output, the level of engagement, the level of people actually you know, embracing this technology and using it. Uh, are we going to see something similar in the metaverse where 
something's going to come out right out of the blue, be such a game changer, an order of magnitude better, that we're going to reduce the time from, let's say, 10 years to four years because someone was able to see things differently? I think that's likely. That appears to be what happens, is that you have technology which sort of develops a little bit in the margins. It's, it's you know, specialists and experts are conscious of the advances that are being made, but the public imagination uh, sort of ignites often somewhat unpredictably because of a particular feature or a particular product. I think, by the way, in terms of virtual reality products, you see already gaming is the cutting edge of it. Um, the gaming industry here in the UAE and in this part of the world is exploding. It's, it's, in fact, it's one of the fastest growing gaming industry, you know, gaming sectors is right here. Uh, and that's partly because of the enabling environment that, 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 that um, you've been able to create here in the UAE, um, which I think has really fostered that. So I think gaming is, is, is a sort of early, that's where you can see early adoption. There are other use cases. Fitness apps are extremely popular because it's, 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 a, it's a fun, immersive way to, to do exercise. You, you, could, you know, you can, you can do a kickboxing class on the surface of the moon. I mean, that's a pretty unusual thing to do. It's a fun way to, to work up a, 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 a sweat. Um, but, but as you say, I think um, the, the kind of technology which suddenly captures the imagination and, 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 and is, is readily used by many millions of people, I think it's often quite difficult to predict exactly how and when that will happen. But you say that um, uh, experts were surprised. I, I, think, I'm not, I think experts were not surprised that AI was able to deliver a product like ChatGBT. Um, AI experts will tell you it's, a, it's, a, it's an impressive but fairly predictable use of AI because you're scouring the internet um, to produce the, 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 you know, these search results. I think what no one could have predicted was that it just sort of caught the public imagination as much as it does. Everyone's now playing around on it. Everyone's asking uh, you know, fun questions um, of, of ChatGBT. And, and I see it in, in, in Meta. We invest billions of dollars in our AI capacities. We use AI systems already for a whole range of things. By the way, also just for protective reasons. So if you look at the, for instance, the diminution, the reduction of measured hate speech on Facebook, the prevalence of hate speech, in other words, how much hate speech can you find as a Terms, in terms of the, you know, as a proportion of the total of content on Facebook, it's now down to 0.02%. Uh, I mean, that means that for every 10,000 bits of content that you might scroll on your, on your Facebook news feed, you'll find two bits of hate speech. I, I wish it could be down to zero. I think it's never going to be zero. But it's been reduced by, I think, around 80% over the last two years because of advances in AI. Because and we've been able to run across AI. geographies, or that's just a general statistic. It's it's across it's across geographies. It's across no, sorry, it's a, it's a, so it's a global, it's, yeah. a, it's a composite figure. Um, but the but the point is, AI is an extremely powerful tool at going after bad content that we don't want on our on, on our platforms that users don't like to see, that advertisers don't want to want to see see either. But also, I, th I think then the flip side of it is also if you think from, from if you think about social media, social media is so much about delight and enjoyment and fun and entertainment and and doing fun things um, which you share with your family and friends. I think AI has huge potential for people to do creative stuff, fun stuff, to give a text or a verbal prompt for a bit of visual content, for, um, um, you know, for, for, for sort of avatar content, uh, for advertisers as well, for particularly, as you know, our, our lifeblood is small and medium-sized businesses. They're the ones who use Facebook to reach, you know, often targeted, you know, pockets of customers. I think AI over time will allow those advertisers simply just to give a verbal prompt you know, I run a shoe shop somewhere in a local town and I want to advertise my shoes to local customers. And you could, you'll could, you be able to give a verbal prompt and say, create a 15 second, you know, cartoon ad of a, of a grandmother playing in the, in the sun with their, you know, granddaughter with my shoes, you know, with new shoes on. I'm, I'm making this up for, for fun. That kind of stuff is stuff that sounds playful, but is actually very useful for advertisers in the future and will be powered by AI. OpenAI, uh, ChatGPT, is that going to be a threat, an opportunity, an integrated product, you think? How are you guys going to deal with this? 
So, so we're not, we're not, we don't do search. We're not a search engine. So clearly, you've seen the announcements recently from Microsoft, Bing, uh, obviously ChatGPT, Google, and Bard, their new, their new product. I, I, I think, the, the, in a sense, the race is on, clearly, in the search sector. But we don't, we don't really do search. No, I think, I think we, as I say, we, we, we are a leader in AI already, certainly AI research. If you look at some of the open source uh, research that we have developed, some of some of the large language models that we have um, developed, which, you know, we have done some really well-beating um, uh, sort of models. Have developed some, some prototype models which allow for instantaneous uh, translation from one language into another, including into non-written languages like Hokkien, for instance, is a non-written language in Southeast Asia. Our AI systems are now able to do instantaneous translation without having to um, use a pivot language through which a translation is, is, is directed. Th these are very, very profound shifts, which in turn will also manifest themselves in uh, product, uh, product developments, particularly through you know, verbal and other prompts that people will be able to use on our, on our services to create, as I say, playful, fun, useful, useful content in the, in the future. So I, I, think, I think AI is, is already very much integrated into our systems, perhaps more than many people um, uh, appreciate. Uh, AI allows us to rank content in a way so the, the stuff that you see on Instagram and Facebook is, is most relevant and enjoyable to you. I mean, that's the remarkable thing about these social media apps. Each one of them I mean, for those of you in the audience today who use Facebook, every single one of your Facebook feeds are unique to you. It's like a sort of fingerprint. It's completely unique to you because the order of the content that you're going to see, you're going to see, you're going to see content from your children, from your grandchildren, from your nieces, your nephews, your parents, and so on, um, in a way that is unique to you. That's the whole point of social media, to foster those links between family and friends. All of that is powered already by AI. It's, if you think about it, it's an immensely complicated thing. The sea of content on the internet that could show up on your feed, and in an instant, our systems seek to try and order the content of what you see first as you scroll on your news feed so that it gives you pleasure, it gives you delight, it's useful to you. All of that is done through highly powerful uh, AI systems which we've invested in over many years already. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? that each single person has a unique feed, which means someone knows what they're scrolling through, what they're seeing, what their likes and dislikes, dislikes are. Like, what is the responsibility that you as companies have? And what should we as governments be doing, in your opinion? Because you were in government before, so you can see both sides of this coin. Oh, I, th I, think, I think governments quite rightly should expect of companies like Meta and others transparency, accountability, give users more control. So on Facebook now, you, if you don't want if you don't want the al ranking algorithm to help rank the content you have, you can basically override it. You can compose your own news feed if you, if you wish. Um, I, I think we, have, we are now industry leading in terms of the amount of data that we publish about the content that circulates on Facebook, the bad content as well, what do we take down. I mentioned earlier the prevalence um, statistic about hate speech. We, 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 we publish all of those statistics every 12 weeks along with our financial results. We give researchers access. So I think user control, accountability, transparency, so people understand how these complex systems work and have a greater sense of control over them. I think those are the things that regulators and governments should rightly expect of our industry. So Nick, uh, we have a minute left and I want to end with a question that's not related to Meta. Um, hypothetically speaking, I think Arsenal will win the Premier League. Is that the question? Well, well you, you were able hope. to forecast my That's no. my hope. The big game tomorrow. Anyway, sorry. Um, you're appointed Prime Minister tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> not, not tomorrow, literally, but like in the future. What would be your first decision as a leader of the government? <laughs> oh, where would I start? Um, do you know, it's slightly, it's a, it sounds like an evasive answer. It's not supposed to be. I would. Um, in my country, in the United Kingdom, I would restore an appreciation of and a respect for geography. Because my own view is that ever since 2016 and the Brexit referendum, the country has been enveloped by this sort of furious debate which is trying to deny geography. We are tectonically a, and historically and culturally a European nation, and yet we seem to have sort of fought against this. Um, so I'd start with geography 
and our European destiny. Reversing Brexit. <laughs> well, that's up to future Nick, generations. It's been an absolute pleasure sharing the stage you. with you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.